everyone. My name is Dr. Kathy Lee Araquino, and I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor of Global Engagement at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. I'm so excited because today we have a wonderful speaker. Her name is Vali, and she's going to share with us many things about her experiences, her history, and also where she is from. So Vali, hello, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, how are you? Fantastic, because I get to speak with you. I'm so <laughs> grateful for this opportunity to learn more about you and your country. So thank you for your time to be with us today. Absolutely, it's my honor. So let's get started and I have a few questions, um, but for our listeners, I would like for them to know more about you. So can you please tell us a little bit about yourself and um, any other information just so our listeners can get to know who you are? Sure. So, like you introduced, my name is Vali, and I am an assistant professor at Southern Oregon University. My pronouns are she, her, and I am an immigrant in the U.S., which means that I was not born here, but I came to the U.S. Um, about six, seven years ago, and I came from uh, India, and within India, there was a lot of migration in my family as well. So my parents were born in the southern tip um, of the Indian Peninsula. So they were born in the states of Tamil Nadu and Kerala. And then they migrated to the capital, Indian capital, New Delhi. And then I migrated to the United States. So we do have a bit of an immigrant history in my family. And other than that, I am a professional counselor and I'm also a researcher and I examine issues on mental health disparities and feminist issues and mental illnesses. So yeah, that's who I am. Fantastic. Um, it's so fascinating for me to learn about how international students end up in the United States or other countries that they choose to study abroad in. So can you talk with us a little bit about how you chose to come to the United States and also what were some of the institutions and degrees that you studied while you were here? Sure. So the United States um, has a lot of influence. You know, it, it, it's a huge superpower and it's, it has a lot of soft power, which means that growing up, I never had to visit the United States. I never had to meet an American, so to speak, to know about the U.S., the media, the, the, the globalization and, and all the products that the U.S. made um, always made sure that I knew what U.S. was somewhat about. So it was this familiar but exotic dream that um, many kids like me had watching movies, watching Hollywood movies, buying toys online and stuff like that. But the reason that really brought me to the United States was my passion for mental health. So growing up, um, as we were entering a very globalized world in the 90s, I realized that structures that were existing to protect the mental health of individuals, be that joint family systems or a large group of friendships that children developed from a young age, they were kind of shifting. And I felt like I did not have um, as much support to maintain my mental health that I would have liked. So I started thinking about mental health from a relatively young age. And eventually I got so passionate that I wanted to make a career out of it. And where else to go to make a career on mental health than and uh, professional counseling than the United States because of the advancement, the research, and, uh, and the, a lot of innovation stuff that's going on here. So I primarily came to the U.S., to further my education in counseling. And in that process, I came for my graduate studies. So I came for my master's in clinical mental health counseling at Pittsburgh State University in Kansas. And that's where I met you, Kathy. Okay. And um, so I did my program, it was about two, two and a half years, extremely powerful program. And the training that I received helped me offer counseling that was trauma informed that was uh, responding to the cultural context of my clients and also was grounded in research. And I loved it so much that I wanted to pass it on to other students. I wanted to be not just a professional counselor, I wanted to teach others to be um, a counselor as well. And that specific role is called a counselor educator. So a person who educates others to become professional counselors. For that, I went to the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. So, so it does come under the UNC system. Right. And that's where I got my PhD in counseling and counselor education. So that is about three, three and a half years of more training, not just on how to refine my skills as a practitioner, but how to refine my skills as an educator, as a researcher, 
and a clinical supervisor as well. So after that is where I, how I ended up at Southern Oregon University now doing what I love the most, which is teach grad students how to be counselors. Well, I just think you're absolutely amazing. When I first met you at Pittsburgh, I knew that you were going to go far. And so I'm just so honored to be able to be a part of this journey and to see what you're doing and what you will continue to do. So thank you for all you do to contribute to the world. Actually, you know, you met me before you met me in Pitt State. You had come to New Delhi, India as part of an education uh, fair, and you were the one who gave me the business card for Pitt State admissions. And I still have it in my apartment back in India. So you actually met me in India before I met you in the U.S. <laughs> well, I'm glad it worked. The recruiting that I did work because you're awesome and you're here. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> funny. Um, well, you know, um, one of the um, first times I traveled to India was before you had met me there at the recruitment fair, but mm -hmm. I actually got to travel during this month of March. Mm -hmm. And I was so excited because I got to actually celebrate one of the biggest festivals, Holi, such yeah. a colorful and um, very unique uh, festival. So mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you if you could share with our listeners um, some of what the history and culture behind this festival, especially there's probably many people who aren't aware of what Holi is. Right. So the, the Holi is a spring festival. So we are welcoming the change in the season. We are welcoming a change in the agricultural cycle as well. So um, it's a spring festival where we want to celebrate the sudden burst of colors that we have all around us in India, being a tropical country. So after the relatively cold and dry months of winter, the sun starts to shine a lot more and the days are a bit longer and the flowers are ready to bloom. So to kind of communicate a harmony with the nature and communicate to ourselves that this is time for a new beginning. So Holi really coincides with that and it follows the lunar calendar. That's why the Holi date changes every year. And on that day, Holi is actually a two day festival. It's a small Holi and the next day is the main day, which is the big Holi. So on the small day, we prepare some very traditional sweets, some very traditional snacks that are um, energy giving that use local seasonal products and uh, help us be more in touch with uh, the seasonal changes and what foods are available and so on. So, and then on the main day of Holi, we all wake up very early and uh, some families do some prayers, some families are just ready and we wear some you know, clothes that are quite dispensable and we go in <laughs> like a playing field or a basketball field, any kind of open area mm -hmm. and just smear colors on each other and water and there is music. So it's, think of it like as a water color festival with good Bollywood music to dance to. <laughs> and it, it helps us break out of that cycle, you know, when our energy has been low throughout the winter months and now in, in March, we are ready to start the new year, the new cycle and and um, get reinvigorated. But it's grounded in a deeper philosophy where celebration is grounded in values of collectivism. So while it's great to celebrate with our immediate families, uh, with our immediate neighbor, Holi is a community event. So you can see people gathered in hundreds, just dancing away and playing and singing and hugging each other. So it's a day to really break away from those restrictions that we have in our mind, those hesitations and reservations. How do I go say hello to them? How do I make a relationship? That day, everybody's smeared in color. So we are goofy <laughs> already. So yeah, so it aligns really well. Yeah, yeah. It sounds, um, and what I experienced was with so much positive energy, um, so many good vibes, and, and just so much like a, an appreciation and joy of life. I remember that being there, so. Absolutely, young, old, men, women, yes. non-binary, everybody plays that day and, and it's a beautiful festival for us. Yes, yes. Um, I know that in the United States, there have been um, other reiterations of celebrating Holi, whether that be through different sorts of runs or other mm -hmm. sort of programming that exists across campus and organizations. So it's been really neat to see how um, that has also become a part of some um, places in the United States to be able to celebrate that and also enjoy the colors and the spirits and the good positive energy of that event. Absolutely. It's beautiful. It's, it's, uh, you can see the culture being exchanged across the world. It's no longer just one directional. When mm -hmm. I was growing up, we would hear about the U.S. Now I'm so glad that 
art festivals are also making a mark here. Yes. So, in speaking about um, what Americans know about India, um, you know, there's so much diversity that exists in India. Um, mm -hmm. And also, besides the festivals of food, different languages, beautiful clothing, varying landscapes, um, the cultures that are actually within the umbrella of the Indian culture, there's so many cultures within that. So, um, in this time, especially some of our students and listeners and faculty and staff may not know much about India besides what you're providing with us today. So, what are some other things that you wish that people knew about your country and your culture that you'd like to share? There is a lot of collectivism and it's embedded in our everyday values, you know, and it ranges from those micro interactions all the way to festivals that are like, you know, um, traditions that are century long. So something I was narrating to a friend was this concept of thank you. So when I first came to the US saying thank you, saying um, uh, like expressing gratitude mm -hmm. to each other uh, is a very explicit and it's a very frequent form of expression here. Somebody opens the door, we say thank you. If somebody brings us a bottle of water, we say thank you. I never had that back home and I don't remember many people around me having that as a habit to say thank you. It doesn't mean I was not grateful to my parents <laughs> right. and my community for supporting me, but it was this understood implied communication that, but of course my mother would do this for me, but of course my neighbor would cook for me when I'm sick because I am going to do that for them and I have done that for them in the past. So if somebody were to, you know, just bring me medicines from the store when I'm unwell, um, by not saying thank you, I'm communicating to them that you are part of my family. You are such an inner circle, but of course you would do this. So I struggled, you know, changing my mindset, coming here, saying thank you for everything. And initially when my friends would say thank you, if I cooked something for them or help them running a few errands, they would say thank you. And it felt like, oh, are they, was that not expected of me to do this? That they're uh -huh. saying, thank you. was it, did I go above and beyond to do this? Which did not feel that way at all. So collectivism and looking out for each other is very deeply embedded. And mm -hmm. of course it comes with its pros and cons, but yeah. uh, it, it's a very deep philosophy. It's changing now with uh, more interactions with other countries, other cultures as well. But But that's a very deep philosophy as well. And how it shows up, even as I went through school systems and uh, my elementary school, middle school, the idea of group projects, the idea of spending time in small friendship circles was just embedded in the coursework, was just embedded in the type of assignments or homeworks we were given. So even the, the buddy system that we have here when kids go for trips and all, we mm -hmm. had a four member buddy system so that even if two people are kind of lax, the other two look out for them. So the idea of one or a pair was not very common. It's always mm -hmm. four or five people together. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think another example of that is we don't have a word for cousin in my language, Tamil. So everybody is either your brother, your sister, mm -hmm. or they are not your family yet. Okay. So the, the title I use for my sibling, my younger sister, is mm -hmm. the same title I would use for um, a cousin who's younger to me. So oh. uh, these through these um, subtle ways, it's communicated that the separation of immediate and extended family is somewhat artificial, and we all mm -hmm. belong to one unit. That's so beautiful. And also, um, really, I want to say, and how I know you um, also mm -hmm. exemplifies why you are the beautiful and wonderful woman you are, and just how you have viewed um, international students learning about Americans and also embracing the education you've got here to get you to where you are. I, I want to ask if you could talk a little bit about that. It's, um, you know, what you're sharing about Indian culture is quite different than maybe some Americans may um, view in their families and also in cultures here. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit, how um, how have you transitioned? How were you able to bring what you know being home, but at the same time trying to assimilate and be a part of what's here, yet at the same time, maintain your identity? I think that sometimes that's a fine line for a lot of our international students and even students who study abroad, right? And who end up living abroad and staying abroad for a long time. Do you have any tips or anything to share about that? That would be very um, useful and also beneficial for us to hear. Absolutely. And uh, my personal journey and the journeys that I have interviewed as part of my research for other international students, 
my conclusion is that it's rarely a linear, straightforward journey. So the person I was six years ago when I first came to the United States, uh, very different mindset, very different uh, identity, very different uh, readiness for growth, right? Mm -hmm. So when international students first come to the U.S. or for that matter, any host country, the immediate mindset is to quickly survive and, and get familiarized with the basic things. So my immediate focus was on how do I take care of myself? How do I make sure I do my you know coursework correctly and make sure I maintain my GPA and so on? It's very immediate, very short term. And that speaks to the, the survival stage, the initial stage where we are somewhat tunnel vision, wanting to make sure we don't color out of the lines and, and uh, play by the rules and, and just, just do what is expected of us. But over time, as I became more familiar, as I built more deeper friendship with domestic students, with local American families, and did a bit of self-work for myself too, I recognized that um, I had to become very comfortable with who I am before I make a decision on whether I want to assimilate the U.S. cultures or if I want to retain uh, my Indian practices. Because it can be very tempting to go either way because of external pressure. So for me, how I dressed, how I spoke, the way I rolled my words in changing my accent when code switching had to become intentional because am I doing this? to meet this artificial idea of what it means to be in living in the US? Am I dressing this way, talking this way, uh, watching these movies or mm -hmm. celebrating these days? So I did not know what Halloween was about in the first year. So it was very artificial for me to, to dress up and go and, and, and not know what was I doing. Mm -hmm. and I felt like I had to do this to belong, to quickly find the friends. But now as I am slowing down and becoming comfortable in who I am, the, the path becomes more clear when do I want to subscribe to more American ideals today, be that uh, the humor that I use, the movie references mm -hmm. that I make when I teach my students, or do mm -hmm. I want to challenge my students a little bit and talk about references outside of their worldview? Uh, mm -hmm. Do I want to talk about uh, movies or video clips that don't immediately align with their worldview? So the, the journey, as much as it is outside in deciding which way do I want to go, was also as much inside about my own mm -hmm. self-awareness. And where is this mm -hmm. coming from? Is it coming from a place of internalized inferiority? You know, because of global mm -hmm. politics, lots of international students, especially international students of color, um, have internalized this idea that anything American is superior. And yes, there are many things that the United States offer that are absolutely wonderful, that have changed my life for the better. But is that a deliberate, intentional choice or am I just making it because it has mm -hmm. that stamp, right? So mm -hmm. it, was, it was a journey that really demands and continues to demand a lot of uh, self-awareness and difficult challenges to myself. Mm -hmm. That's so deep. Um, that's lots of points in there and concepts to really think about. And also um, for people to do some self-reflection to see how that impacts their life and their journey. Uh, I wanted to talk with you because um, as a professor, you're a leader in the classroom, um, but also I know that you're a leader with your family, you're a leader in your community. Um, everywhere you go, you're a leader. And just because um, you're you know, someone doesn't have to be the president or the CEO to be a leader. I um, mean, so in that, I, I think that there's lots of different practices and also cultural aspects that impact leadership. So I wanted to ask you in this journey that you've had that hasn't been a linear journey, but also at the same time, the different roles that you've had. I know that you are very involved in the Indian Student Association and the International Student Association, but all the different realms of what you've had. Um, how do you think these cultural of uh, domains have impacted you as a leader? Uh, and also as you're talking to others, um, what are some tips that you would give that they should be paying attention to in regards to different cultures and how that will impact them as leaders as we're navigating through this global society? Absolutely. I think in various leadership um, places that I've been, be that the one who's being led or the one who's leading, um, keeping relationships central to the organization or to the community has been very powerful in my experience. Uh, when people, when leaders value the, the worth of a person as opposed to just a list of tasks they complete, 
people are more motivated to go above and beyond what is expected of them. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a wonderful quote by the famous psychologist Carl Rogers. He says, when I accept myself for who I am, I realize that I'm ready to change to be even better. You know, that's a paraphrase, mm -hmm. but when we accept people for who they are and, and offer them support and offer them the resources to help them grow, they are willing to grow above and beyond. So even in your role in, in the pit, in pit state, when you were leading the international programs, you have kept relationships as central. I personally experienced that, benefited from that. I was ready to show up at 5.30, 6 a.m. for international student orientations, not because from a place of fear, but because of the trust that you placed on the people you were leading. So when I am in the classroom, uh, especially uh, the past year in 2020 has been such a challenging one with the pandemic, mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, extreme racial tensions. Mm -hmm. I cannot reduce my students. I cannot reduce my mm -hmm. colleagues to a list of tasks that need to be submitted by a deadline. Mm -hmm. That is a dehumanizing process. And in the long run, it hurts everyone. It, it hurts me. It hurts my students. And they go mm -hmm. on and recreate this in other leadership places. Mm -hmm. So I have tried to foster a humanizing space, even in the classroom. So we start the classrooms and the lessons with a meaningful check-in. So students mm -hmm. in small groups of four and five, I model to them how to check in with each other, not just mm -hmm. superficial, how are you, but really mm -hmm. engaging in deep listening, not just because we are people, but we, get, we are also professional counselors. We should learn how to mm -hmm. listen. So creating a space for non-judgmental listening and communicating that you value the person beyond the list of tasks can have a powerful role on creating and transforming the organization into a family. Mm -hmm. So that is definitely, we do that in our classes, especially now because of trauma-informed practices that are necessary as an instructor, as a professor. Mm -hmm. And my students then end up doing that with their clients at their internship sites. They don't just start off the bat and say, okay, let's talk about your depression symptoms. Right. You start the right. session with slowing down, mm -hmm. checking in, how are you? Mm -hmm. and, and what has your day or your week been like before let's go to the you know the, the required tasks and mm -hmm. similarly uh, right now i am the co-chair for the riders consortium with the association for multicultural counseling and development and students especially students from historically marginalized communities uh, in the counseling field come to our organization so that they can learn how to write for research and that can be a very um, meaningful and vulnerable space for doc students, for emerging professionals to come and say, teach us how to write so that we get published. Mm -hmm. And again, I should not reduce them just to one or two manuscripts. I need to know their story. I need to know mm -hmm. where these insecurities, these fears come from mm -hmm. and offer them a dignifying space. So that has been my experience that when we invest in the relationship and trust the people that we are leading or are led by um, in a humanizing way, the, the destination we reach is far greater, far more beautiful than we can expect. Thank you for sharing all of that. There's just um, so much to process and I love listening to you um, when you're talking <laughs> about different cultures and everything that you do. Uh, so uh, March, oh, we were talking about holy, but also March is Women's History Month. So this is also a very special month. Mm -hmm. uh, so since we're talking about different cultures, I was wondering if you could talk about um, some of the issues that you feel Indian women face that may be either similar or to different, uh, similar or different to some of the issues that you have seen that American women may face here in the United States. Absolutely. So, so I identify as a cis woman too, and again, that comes with its um, different privileges and and um, uh, oppression in India for sure. So some of the issues that women do face in India are comparable to the ones that women face in the United States, be that objectification or hypersexualization of women's bodies or uh, controlling what goes on in women's bodies and um, who, who gets to have a say in it. The specifics may look different, but patriarchy in its essence, oppression in its essence looks very similar, which is let's not give agency to the people uh, to regulate their own lived experience, to regulate their own bodies. While it may show up in terms of, for instance, maybe abortion rights in the United States, it shows up in terms of menstrual hygiene and excessive rape culture that is permeating different parts of India. 
So those are some elements that are comparable where the root cause is embedded in as in, um, in viewing women as inferior and patriarchy and, and embedding this idea of that there are two genders, one is powerful and one wants to be the victim. So I see this, I have seen this so far in both the countries, but there are some unique experiences too that make it very different. Uh, this idea of caste, the idea of class, the idea of education access, the idea of skin color, all of these also play a role into how women are viewed. While I may be, uh, I may identify as a woman in India, I also come with many layers of protections or privileges through my upper caste, through my access to college education, through being temporarily able-bodied, right? But I have seen women counterparts who do not have these privileges and have become horrifying, traumatizing victims of patriarchy, traumatizing victims of violence against women. So right now we are suffering from that where regrettably Delhi is known as the rape capital of the world because um, women are just not safe. And the idea of victim blaming and, and holding victims accountable for their own trauma has become such a normalized aspect uh, that it is deeply, deeply saddening. But what I'm also seeing so far, my younger sister, she's a, she's an attorney with the Supreme Court back in India, and she tells stories that there is also a lot of Indian feminism on the rise. Indian mm -hmm. feminism differs from the mm -hmm. dominant U.S. feminism, mm -hmm. recognizing that Western ideals don't apply for us in the same transferable way. Mm -hmm. Women's ideals in, in India look different because of familial values, mm -hmm. because of uh, different issues regulating their body. Um, Indian feminism is on the rise where men, women, and non-binary folks are stepping in to talk about, this is not okay, this needs mm -hmm. to stop. So there is a lot more advocacy that's happening. Mm -hmm. One specific advocacy that some of you may know or not know is the idea of access to safe clean, environmentally friendly menstrual hygiene products. So recently, somebody from my hometown, Coimbatore in Tamil Nadu, uh, started uh, making eco-friendly menstrual products because young girls had to quit going to school because they didn't have access to uh, menstrual products. So he did his own research, started experimenting with different fabrics and he refused to patent his idea so that people continue to have their menstrual products at a as, at an accessible rate so feminism mm -hmm. can look very different all the way from advocating mm -hmm. in front of big social institutions to individual innovations that really transform the community mm -hmm. and eventually a movie was made out of it and um, and it was a revolutionary one for sure where uh, women's bodies were given the dignity and the respect that it deserves well, um, you gave some great examples of some of the different movements that are taking place now. Um, do you feel that because these movements are taking place now and there's more attention to that, that there are even more women that are coming out trying to lead change to regard to these issues? And if so, do you mind sharing a couple other examples of that? Absolutely. So when the Me Too movement started off in the United States and, and pretty much all over the world, it, it did have a profound impact in India, too, where uh, women, uh, trans men, trans women also started talking about mm -hmm. their own every normalized experiences of sexual harassment. But I really want to make it explicit that while it may be easy for me, relatively easy for me mm -hmm. or my sister or somebody in my family to talk about it because we have um, relative wealth, uh, a family legacy that's established. It's a two parent family and uh, we have the caste privilege. It truly may not be easy at all. It could be life threatening for a woman from a lower caste background to come out and say that I have been a victim of sexual harassment or rape or assault. So uh, all these intersecting identities create this completely different hierarchy on who gets to say and who gets to earn their rights and live their rights, right? So mm -hmm. we can see very regularly, even recently, a medical doctor in, in the state of Maharashtra, she committed, she completed suicide because of excessive sexual harassment combined with caste-based harassment that she faced um, while working as a medical professional. 
So that speaks volumes about how even if somebody rises up in the class hierarchy, mm-hmm. and even if somebody is holding a relatively traditionally valued professional role, the caste has a profound impact on who gets to speak up, who gets to mm-hmm. uh, receive the support that they do. So that is disturbing that even in uh, the Me Too movement, even in fighting for women's rights, there is a lot of hierarchy on who gets to have their say first. Mm-hmm. Well, all of that was um, so moving, um, but also so informative. Uh, mm-hmm. So before we wrap up, is there anything else that you'd like our listeners to know about India or just in general, anything you'd like to sh- say to share with all of us today? Well, um, you may know India is a people of more than a billion people. So this is just one person you have heard. So I, I hope that whatever we liked, whatever we didn't like, is just probably attributable to just one person's experience of having lived in India. So just like my experience of the United States is that of just one person, one international student, recognizing that there is more diversity than what a 30-minute interview can capture and and being led by that, being led by that okay. curiosity that, yes, we heard this person's experience. What does the experience of an immigrant worker in India mm-hmm. look like as opposed to a professor who's from India? So recognizing there's a lot of heterogeneity and um, it comes with its own rich experiences. Well, thank you so much for your time. We really enjoyed um, talking with you today, and I look forward to more opportunities to hear from you. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And wishing everyone a happy Holi, whatever version of Holi we are ready to play. (laughs) Definitely. I'll talk to you again soon. Thank you, everybody. Bye. And we appreciate you listening.